Okay, we're continuing on our exploration of chapter 10. And we have just finished describing VSCPR, so we're going to use VSCPR to predict some things. To predict the geometry and bond angles of phosphorus trichloride, so phosphorus has five electrons. I'm going to draw the Lewis structure first, plus three times seven for chlorine. And where do I get that? So phosphorus here, it's group 5A. That means one, two, three, four, five for phosphorus, six, seven for chlorine. Okay, so that's how I'm counting up the valence electrons. So uh, that's 26, 26 electrons. Phosphorus in the center, Cl, 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 that's six electrons, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. And these, so if you look at our phosphorus, so phosphorus has four things, four things, three bonds, one lone pair of electrons. This means uh, trigonal pyramidal. So it means trigonal pyramid geometry, I'm sorry, geometry and bond angles. So it's going to be the angles here, the tetrahedron is about 109.5 degrees. It's going to be a little less than. So less than that because of this big negative group here, it's going to push those chlorines down a little bit. Okay? Same thing for ICl4 minus. So iodine and chlorine, they all have seven. So this is five times seven plus one for this minus one. And we get, uh, so five times 30, 36 electrons. So iodine in the center with the chlorines around. I got a feeling I put a lone pair in the center, but I didn't want to, I don't know what its geometry is going to be. So 36 electrons, that looks ugly. Let's see if there's 36 electrons. So we placed four. Placed four, uh, or eight, I'm sorry, four bonds, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. Okay, so this means, so we have, if you look at the iodine, look at the iodine center, there are eight things, I'm sorry, eight, there's six things, six things, four bonds, two lone pairs, and that is going to be octahedral, octahedral electronic geometry and square planar so molecular geometry so the square planar and molecular geometry and the bond angles see bond angles so square planar uh, they're all going to be perpendicular so the chlorines are all going to be perpendicular to each other it's all 90 degrees Okay, I'll just say the angle here, all perpendicular or 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, sure, I'll put pi over 2 radians for you radian folks. Okay, and if you wonder where I'm getting this from, where if it's uh, the previous, this is where we ended up, right, so... The, these numbers here is six things, four bonding, two lone pairs uh, from this chart. That's where I'm getting uh, this stuff here from the VSEPR chart. Okay? Now let's predict the shape of a larger molecule. Uh, predict the geometry in each interior atom of methanol and make a sketch of the molecule. So, methanol. So, uh, carbon has four electrons plus. 4 times 1 for hydrogen, 
plus 6 for oxygen, so we have 14 electrons to place. So we have a skeletal structure, and then carbon tends to bond with 4, oxygen tends to bond with 2. So I'm putting that there, and that's the structure. And so I've placed five lines as 10 electrons, 12, 14. So now there's actually carbon has an octet, oxygen has an octet, and everything has a formal charge of zero. So if you look, I'm just changing colors for the colorblind folks. Uh, the center here, this is tetrahedral geometry. So tetrahedral electronic geometry, tetrahedral molecular geometry. The structure here, it's tetrahedral electronic geometry, but it's a bent, bent structure there for that, that center. Okay? All right, so this is time for you to pause if you want to try. What's the shape of ammonia? Uh, and I have given you the, uh, the, the chart there. Um, so ammonia has uh, four things, three bonding, one lone pair. It's pyramidal. Uh, ozone, there's a Lewis structure for ozone. Uh, it has the central atom has three things. It has two bonding, one lone pair. It's bent. Okay, so uh, we're going to go and talk about, uh, we, we mentioned polar covalence, but there's a difference between polar bonding and polar molecules. So polar bonding means that uh, one atom gets more electrons than the other atom. Uh, polar molecule means that the geometry of the molecule, there's a positive end and a negative end. So for two atoms, so hydrochloric acid here, or hydrogen chloride, uh, depends on if you're in the gas phase or not, but uh, hydrogen chloride here, uh, there is a polar bond, and the electron density is drawn towards the chlorine, and because of that, there is a negative end of the molecule, and the electron density ripped away from the hydrogen gives this end of the molecule a positive end. So hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule. Carbon dioxide, uh, there is electron density being drawn towards one oxygen, but also density is being drawn toward the other. And what happens is, is that these two cancel out. So if you've studied uh, vector math before, if, so I'm sitting in a chair right now, and my weight is pushing me towards the center of mass of the Earth. The chair is pushing back at my center of mass at an equal opposite force. That's the reason why I'm not falling on my, uh, through the floor right now. So because of that, that force that's keeping me up. So the forces cancel and I'm sitting still. Right, so same thing with uh, these, the, the force, the, the uh, I should say the, the vector, it's not a force, but the, the, uh, the vector cancels. Now you look at water, water is a bent structure. Uh, and the electron density is drawn toward the oxygen. And these are both arrows. And this is confusing because water it can be drawn like this, but it's bent. So you're like, okay, well, these arrows then cancel. Well, don't forget that this is, a, this is not a linear, it's not a flat molecule, it's a bent molecule. And because of that, the, um, the, the partial vector, so there's this, this vector that's diagonal here has a, you can break it down a component, a component going full up and a component going in. The components going in cancel, but the ones going up add, and there's a very big dipole moment there. So water has a particularly high uh, dipole moment. And uh, water is a weird substance. We'll talk about it more next semester if you take me next semester, or you take someone else, I'm sure. But uh, we will talk about how water is weird. Okay, so this is how we determine shape and polarity. Draw the Lewis structure and determine the method of geometry. Uh, see if there are polar bonds. If there are polar bonds, then look for net dipole moments. Okay, so let's do the so what with that. <clears throat> Here is this in the book. So, uh, first of all, all bents and all pyramid. Every single bent molecule, every single pyramid molecule is polar. 
I don't care if it's ozone. Ozone is all oxygens, all the same atom. Ozone is a polar molecule, okay? So all pyramids, all bents are polar. Now, linear, planar, and tetrahedral. <clears throat> so with this, if they have all the same atom, if each atom is exactly the same, it's not polar. If one atom is different, it's polar, okay? So let's look at these here. Here is carbon dioxide linear molecules, carbon dioxide and hydrogen cyanide. Carbon dioxide, there's two oxygens on the outside. Same atom uh, in a linear molecule, it's nonpolar. Hydrogen cyanide, linear molecule, two different atoms, it's polar. So the electron density in this case is drawn towards the nitrogen. It doesn't matter what the atoms are. If it's, if it's fluorine, chlor carbon, and nitrogen in a linear molecule, it's going to be polar. It's only if the two atoms are the same is it not is it nonpolar? Same thing with planar, planar geometry. If all the atoms are the same, it's nonpolar. If one atom is different, it's polar. Okay, same thing with tetrahedral. If you have uh, here, I've drawn methane and uh, carbon tetrachloride, and uh, both in red here. They're both nonpolar. Let me instead draw this molecule. Let me put uh, so chloroform. Chloroform here. One atom's different. Chloroform is polar. What about methylene chloride here? That's polar because there's different atoms. What about chloromethane? Polar. Atoms are different. What about methane? Aha, nonpolar, because they're all the same. Okay? So when one atom is different, uh, it's polar. When they're all the same, nonpolar. Four tetrahedral. Uh, and now for um, bipyramid, bipyramidal molecules, uh, it's the planar plus the linear. You have to determine uh, which one is it. it so uh, all seesaws, all. Um, all T-shaped are going to be polar, um, but the uh, the the bipyramidal and the linear you have to apply the not the uh, the rules for that. Same thing with octahedral. For the planar molecules, follow the same thing with trigonal planar. If one if if uh, they're all the same groups, it's nonpolar. It's uh, if one's different, it's polar. Same thing with octahedral. They're all the same, it's nonpolar. One's different, it's polar. So. That's how you determine that. So determine if ammonia is, is polar. There's the Lewis structure. It's a pyramid. All pyramids are polar. Okay. So look at these molecules and tell me, are they polar or nonpolar? Well, for this one here, you have electron density going this way and this way, and those vectors cancel out. So this one is nonpolar. Uh, same idea, you have electron density going this way, uh, but the fluorine is a, I'll draw, th the fluorine is a thicker arrow, so because of that, this molecule is polar. And uh, you have arrows here for this one, but they cancel out and you have an overall this way, this molecule is polar. So, uh, and uh, this is also known, this this right here is known as uh, one trans one two uh, dichloroethene. So, uh, maybe you've heard of cis and trans. Trans means that the important groups are opposite of each other and cis means the important groups are on the same side. So cis and trans. And maybe you've heard of this uh, for trans fatty acids. So things like margarine and other hydrogenated oils contains trans fatty acids. I'm so scared of trans fatty acids. So what is cis and trans? So um, <clears throat> here on Earth, uh, every leaving Every living creature stores fat in what's known as a triglyceride. So tri means three, 
So triglyceride and glycerin. So glycerin is this molecule here. You have carbon, 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 three of them, and OH. So this is glycerin. I'm drawing it this way. But really what's going to happen, and then there's, there's hydrogens then there. <clears throat> what really happens, though, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, one of the oxygen is going to point the other way because of, of uh, geometry, because it's, it's not going to line up. And then uh, the all fatty acids found naturally, um, there are cis. They're all cis fatty acids, and they, that means they have kinks in the chains. And what a, what a hydrogenated oil is, you'll get carbons that have double and triple bonds in them, in these chains. And when you hydrogenate them, you add acid to them. So, uh, and when you add acid to a triple bond here, you will form both cis and trans isomers. Trans is actually a little lower in energy, so you might form a little more trans than cis. And then the bond, where everything is always uh, cis, you, the human body suddenly has trans to deal with, it, it's a little more difficult for us to process. It's harder on our bodies to process trans fatty acids. So they are bad for you in that regards. Maybe you've heard of saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Unsaturation means that there are double and triple bonds. That means the more highly unsaturated, that means there's more double and triple bonds. So plants and fish oils tend to be unsaturated uh, with the exception of coconut oil. Coconut oil is, is very saturated. Uh, Animal-based uh, fats tend to be uh, very saturated, which means all single bonds, so no double or triple. Uh, and there's a joke here for trans. So what is this? This is transparence. So get it? You better be laughing at home. I know these things. I know if you're laughing or not. You need to laugh at my jokes, okay? So this is transparency. <laughs> Great chemistry humor. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about uh, something else. Um, this is one of those, you don't say, well, uh, water and oil don't mix. And I'm sure you are falling off of your couch and surprised when I'm me saying that. Uh, water and oil don't mix. Why don't they mix? because oil is nonpolar and water is polar. So we'll talk about this more next semester, but generally speaking, polar substances will mix with polar substances and nonpolar will mix with nonpolar substances. Okay, that's the like dissolves the like rule, generally speaking. Okay, so, um, and actually it's water. Water hates the nonpolar. The, the polar pushed the nonpolar out of the way. The nonpolar liked the polar better. But it's non nonpolar being snobby exclusive with their with their set charge separations. Anyways, they don't mix. Um, but uh, maybe you have you ever like cooked with something got gotten uh, grease on your hands from cooking meat, or maybe you've got like olive oil on your hands, and it's hard to get off, right? You can you can rub it on your shirt, you can rub it on a towel, but there's always this little sheen of oil on your skin. And it's hard to get rid of. You're like, oh, you know what? I know this magic substance. It's called soap. And I will put water on it. I will rub my hands together. And then this stuff that I can't get off my hands will magically just wash away. And soap is magical. Soap is magical. You can get oil, which doesn't like to mix with water, to mix with water. So how does that work? They, it works by forming something called a micelle. So a soap, soap is also stands for sodium surfactant. If you've ever made soap, the way you make soap is you take fat, either plant or animal, uh, and you put lye into it. Lye is sodium hydroxide. What that does is it breaks the, so pontification reaction breaks the glycerin, the triglyceride bond. You get glycerin coming off and then you have uh, for sodium hydroxide, you have sodium surfactant. You have a sodium surfactant coming off there, and this is the anionic surfactant. So they're the cheapest one. There's other types of surfactants, but we're just going to talk about this one here. This is the cheapest one here. The most commonly used is a sodium anionic surfactant 
typically made from uh, hitting uh, some sort of uh, fatty uh, triglyceride with lye. Okay, and so one feature about this molecule is that there's a polar head and there's a nonpolar head. So this mus molecule has a long nonpolar side. And what it does is it forms a structure called a micelle. So you have the oil droplet in the center, and then the, so I'm drawing a circle for the polar part and a long line for the nonpolar part, because it tends to form carbon, hydrocarbon chains. Uh, and it forms this, this structure around the oil. And this structure is called a micelle, where all the nonpolar ends point towards the oil, and then the polar ends point out towards water. In this case, it's negatively charged. And now, then, this whole micelle, this whole thing can now go into water. And do they have a picture of a micelle? Oh, they don't have that there. Okay. So it's kind of it's kind of a spherical structure. And uh, for you biology inclined folks, uh, you can get what's called a uh, liposome. A liposome is when you have the polar ends; they they form together. I was trying to draw it above there too, so. They can form a structure here. This is called a liposome. And specifically, if this liposome goes around, you can get a membrane. So if you know what a uh, cell membrane, a cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. So what does that mean? You have a phosphate group on the outside. So here is your phosphate group. Here is your lipid bilayer two layers. So phosphates on the outside, lipids facing each other, phosphates on the inside, phospholipid bilayer, that's a cell membrane. Okay, so works works by good old chemistry, polar nonpolar. Right, who would have thought that biology and chemistry had so much in common? Stay tuned next time for more adventures in chemistry.